Will you be remembered after you're dead? The Zedless Deadless podcast about obscure people from history with me, Izzy Lawrence. Hello and welcome to episode number three, series 10 of the Zedless Deadlist. I should know these things, but it is February now and all manner of knowledge is passing through my ears very quickly. It's like trying to hold on to water, it really is. So, I've had a very exciting month. I've been doing a lot of work for Making History on Radio 4 on Tuesday, which I believe will be tomorrow, if you're listening to this on the day it is released. I'll be talking to Bob Nicholson all about Victorian Music Hall. And it's quite cool because hopefully they'll use some I was going to say footage, but that's not the right word, audio of me at a gig. So you might hear a bit of my stand-up as well. We'll be talking about the difference between the modern comedy circuit and Victorian Music Hall. There was a big difference. I found this extract online of um, what you'd expect to see in a music hall. So have a listen to this. Dickens's Dictionary of London by Charles Dickens Jr, 1879. Music Halls. Ballet, gymnastics and so-called comic singing form the staple of the bill of fare. But nothing comes foreign to the music hall proprietor. Performing animals, winners of walking matches, successful scholars, shipwrecked sailors, swimmers of the channel, conjurers, ventriloquists, tightrope dancers, campanologists, clog dancers, sword swallowers, velocipedists, champion skaters, imitators, marionettes, decanter equilibrists, champion shots, living models of marble gems, statue marvels, fire princes, mysterious youths, spiral bicycle ascensionists, Flying children, empresses of the air, kings of the wire, vital sparks, Mexican boneless wonders, white-eyed musical kaffirs, strong-jawed ladies, cannonball performers, illuminated fountains, and that remarkable musical eccentricity, the orchestre militaire, all have had their turn on the music hall stage. Strangers to the business may be warned that the word turn, as understood in the profession, means the performance for which the artist is engaged and frequently comprises four or more songs, however much or little of pleasure the first effort may have given the audience. Furthermore, as many of the popular performers take several turns nightly, it is undesirable to visit many of these establishments on the same evening, as it is quite possible to go to four or five halls in different parts of the town and to find widely diverse stages occupied by the same sets of performers. Now, Zazzle, the human cannibal, did happen at the London Aquarium, which is, weirdly, as I believe I did in an interview with Andre Vincent, isn't an aquarium. It is a music hall in London. But Zazzle was a woman who was fired out of a cannonball. No, she wasn't. She was fired out of a cannon. Sharp. What was slightly frustrating about the piece was he didn't really get into the depths of why female performers in particular were more popular in musical than they were, say, in the early noughties and late nineties on the UK comedy circuit. And we didn't really explain how the comedy circuit was imported almost directly from America in the 1980s, the current version of it anyway. So it's it slightly frustrating. I mean, I did my dissertation, even though I did geography. I know, I know. Yeah, I can colour in pictures with the best of them. Part of my geography degree, I was exploring the female space and the male space and how the comedy circuit was a very male space and why that was, because it didn't really make any sense. And looking at the history of it, it looks like music halls were for the working classes. And so you could have female performers like Marie Lloyd um, singing songs which were very lewd. Actually, they weren't lewd at all. They were nursery rhymes. She'd just wink at the incorrect moment and make them filthy. But you could have women expressing themselves in quite uh, naughty ways, even though this was um, there was Chamberlain laws where you had to clear what you were going to say on stage with the Lord Chamberlain. So you had to be quite careful. I believe my own mother was arrested. She was in the paper. I know this much, right? She refuses to talk about it, but my granny told me a little bit. But my mum was um, at Liverpool University and was in a sketch where she was lying in a wheelbarrow with a boy on top of her. They were clothed. The sketch was they would be wheeled on stage by somebody else going, can you help? They got stuck together. Eh, it's amusing. But my mum, like, that was against the law. It's why Peter Cook... Um, started the Establishment Cup because you could actually have free speech in this country at all. You had to clear it all with the government before you got up on a, a professional stage and said, bollocks, 
yeah, it was different times, man. But basically, the musical was very working class in the fact that you had prostitutes there, you had people smoking opium, you had pie and chips, lots of smoke, that sort of thing. And it was quite a rowdy atmosphere. Now, what happened was you had the introduction of cinema, which late 1890s, early 1900s, basically undercut the pricing of the musicals. So the musicals went up market. If you go up market, you cannot have wonderful opera singing girls in that sort of environment. You could still have the blokey comics being slightly lewd and everything else, but everybody had to go a bit up market. All the filthy acts went on the working men's clubs, and you can't do that if you're a female comic. And as female comics kind of left by the wayside because they didn't have a venue anymore, because they didn't have the audience anymore that they used to. And obviously they couldn't go into film because most of the female comics were singers. And if you sing, you're not really going to make it in the movies because the talkies didn't come till much later on. It was an odd time, the 1890s. Here's here's an odd one for you. One of my favourite facts about the 1890s, Winston Churchill was very famous, but not that Winston Churchill. Our Winston Churchill, the Winston Churchill, the British Prime Minister, the journalist that you think of, he wrote to Winston Churchill saying, please, please don't be cross if I use your name. Would you like it if I put Winston S. Churchill or Winston Spencer Churchill when I sign things so people can defend differentiate us because Winston Churchill was an author he was an American author very successful he actually gave up authoring towards the end and there's a quote from him in like the 1940s just going I can't even remember writing a book he wrote a lot of books mainly about what life was like under the British just before the American Revolution those were his big popular ones with the sort of historical fictions And yeah, he was way more famous than Churchill. Churchill was, yeah. But at no point did our Churchill pretend to be that Churchill or that Churchill pretend to be our Churchill. And I've got a gig recording of the Zedis Deadlist actually in Oxford in the quite noisy Jericho Cafe. Because if you've been to the Jericho Cafe, the gig is held in the basement, but the restaurant is still working upstairs. So you can hear quite a lot of the restaurant in this recording of Adam Mastriani, who is wonderful. And I really wanted to interview him as well, but the moment... like. We did this Zedless Deadlist gig in Oxford and then about a week later he went off to Cambridge, Massachusetts. So ah, oh, I was very frustrated, but he is definitely uh, one of the funniest, interesting Zedless Deadlist talks ever because we're not talking about St. Paul. We're talking about Deutero Paul. And I can't say Deutero um, in an English accent, as you can see. If you are religious, this one might not be... And I think it will be for you. I think there will be some jokes, but there there are any jokes, okay? Uh, so please don't be offended. It is just words. It doesn't mean anything. It's like prayer. <laughs> what I find interesting, though, is it is, you know, the, coming at it from a very sort of, you know, I'm agnostic slash atheist, as in I live as though I'm an atheist, but I do not know. Um, I find it very um, interesting going to places like the British Museum and speaking to archaeologists like Irvin Finkel and how much the Bible is actually used in our understanding of the past. I mean, it is an actual document and we'll be talking about the new testament in this um, particular talk or adam will and yeah it's fascinating because these it is an important document whether you believe you know in it or not it does affect your life because our entire culture is formed by this one particular book and it appears that St Paul isn't the man you thought he was. Well, that one isn't. That one might be, but that one isn't. Enjoy. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I'm Adam Mastery. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk to you guys about um, the guy in history who succeeded at convincing the most people that he was someone that he wasn't, and then influencing the belief of literally billions of people. I'm not talking about Shakespeare and the fact that most of his plays were probably plagiarized, or the fact that Elvis stole all the songs from a guy named uh, Big Boy Crudda, or the fact that Dan Brown is really a youth minister who died 30 years ago and was reanimated by a shaman. (laughs) Um, I'm talking about uh, the Apostle Paul, and the guy who claimed to be the Apostle Paul. And I don't know if you heard um, a slight, like, uh, squishy squeaking sound earlier when uh, Izzy started talking about religious things and everybody's balls retracted a little bit. Because we, we go into this mode, right, when people talk about religious things in a, like, in a context we didn't expect it, where, like, you just kind of go dead behind the eyes and just sort of, like, nod vaguely until you can come up with an excuse to leave, like, oh, I have to put my dog down. Um, <laughs> but I'm not trying to evangelize or anti-evangelize. Um, Tonight, honestly, nothing I say should challenge any deeply held beliefs you have, because imagine, like, 
if you stopped believing in God tonight and then like died and it turned out God was real and you were at the pearly gates and St. Peter was like, dude, what, what was up? You believed in God your whole life. Like what happened? And you were like, oh, a guy showed me some slides in a basement. <laughs> and you'd be like, but, what, but wait, so like God's, remember when he sent his son and he like got crucified on earth and you, like, you fucked up. Like, yeah, fucked up. <laughs> uh, in case you don't know who the Apostle Paul is, he was like the original missionary. Like before missionary was mainly a sex thing, right? Um, <laughs> A side note, uh, the reason why the missionary position is called what it is is because missionaries used to go from town to town and people would be like, I'm not going to listen to this missionary and they would have sex instead. No. <laughs> um, but Paul wasn't just any missionary, he was, he was like the Superman of missionaries. If like, if Superman's main superpower had been convincing people that humankind is redeemed through the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, and if Superman's kryptonite was butt sex. No. Um, <laughs> So he is responsible for, after the death of Jesus, spreading uh, all of Christianity around the Mediterranean from Tyre and Sidon all the way to Antioch and Poseidon. You know they're all goat fuckers up there. <laughs> he, even, he even had a lands holiday in Malta. The dude got around, right? He is probably almost single-handedly responsible for the, for the reason that uh, Christianity has billions of followers today. And along the way, he wrote all these letters that you're probably familiar with. Romans, uh, Corinthians. Um, if you haven't read the New Testament, uh, you have the Gospels, and then you have all these letters. So it's like you, it's like you have these Gospels and like the director's commentary for the rest of it. He wrote most of that. Um, the problem is, and most scholars will tell you this, even the religious ones, most of them don't think he wrote all of them. They think these were written by a different guy, not the Apostle Paul, but a guy that they call Deutero Paul. Um, Deutero meaning new. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why they think this. Um, one is that the vocabulary that Deutero Paul uses is different from the vocabulary of the guy that we think is the authentic Paul. And this makes sense, right? There's a set of words that you use generally on a day-to-day -day basis, and you start to suddenly sound different. People get suspicious. So, like, if you watch Geordie Shore, um, you know that they talk like, everybody knows me, I pull my pants, me pants down on the odd occasion, I was probably going to have a wee on the floor. Um, but if Charlotte start, suddenly starts talking like, uh, Verily, my repute is renowned, I am wont to relinquish mine britches ever than none, perhaps t'was my premeditation that I should micturate upon the earth, you might be like, something has changed about Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, quotes from real Paul. Another reason that we think there is Paul and then Deutero Paul is that the theology is different between his letters. So here's a quote from 1 Corinthians, which everybody thinks is authentic. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. I wish all men were as I myself am, but if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So we know a couple things from this excerpt, right? It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Paul sounds a lot like I do after I'm rejected on a date. <laughs> oh, it's good. It's good for a man. It's, no, it's, that's fine. It's great. Um, I wish all men were as I myself am. Single. Um, uh, and he thinks that marriage is not a thing we should strive for, but a thing that you have you can do if you can't keep the old trouser viper in the zip cage. <laughs> Contrast that uh, to Deutero Paul, this is from Ephesians. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. He who loves his wife loves himself. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So, authentic Paul is like, guys, let's try not to be married. And then Deutero Paul is like, okay, now that everybody's married, um, first of all, that's great. Um, second of all, women be quiet. Um, third of all, not only is this fine, but this is like the only reason anyone leaves their parents' house. Yeah. To get married. Um, in fact, uh, Paul and Deutero Paul, uh, may be true to his name, disagree on a lot of things when it comes to women. Uh, this is a quote from First Romans, uh, the real Paul. I commend to you Phoebe, a deacon of the church in... I, I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people, and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been a benefactor of many people, including me. Um, so I was raised in the Catholic Church, um, and in that context, a deacon is kind of just like a, like a shitty priest. Like, a priest who like couldn't really hack it, but like kind of gets to still hang around. Like, they're a member of the clergy, but they're not like really pulling the head. They're like, they're like the Ringo Starr of the clergy. <laughs> um, Whereas Deutero Paul, uh, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's important to know your deacon actually in this case, uh, the ancient Greek is diakonos, which Paul used to describe himself. So Paul is saying Phoebe is doing the same job that I do. Phoebe, of course, is a girl. Um, Deutero Paul is like, a woman should learn in quietness, full submission. 
I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Um, so Deutero Paul uh, is like, right, fool me once. It was the damn women. <laughs> Uh, so they have to be quiet. He does go on, of course, to redeem himself. He continues, But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, love uh, holiness with propriety. So obviously women are fine if they're just squirting out babies. Everything's cool. Um, I just want to say, I don't agree with this. Obviously, I think women and men should be equal. I love women. Um, my mom is a woman. Um, Oprah Winfrey is a woman. I love them. Um, <laughs> And I should point out, like, this is the ancient world, right? Progressive ideas about women are sort of a long way off. Like, progressive feminist ideas for this uh, period of time is like, hmm, maybe we shouldn't make women menstruate in huts. <laughs> um, uh, in fact, for millennia, people thought that women were just, like, failed men, that, like, were not fully formed. People thought that humans were like Mr. Potato Heads, and God had just forgotten to put on the penis bit. Um, so in that context, Paul is the real Paul is sort of progressive for his time. Um, I have to wonder though, what made Deutero Paul just like hate women so much? Like, did he get his heart broken? Did a woman like give him bad investment advice? Was a woman like, dude, Deutero Paul, you really have to get in on this whole golden calf thing. You should put a lot of money into this. People are going fucking bananas for this golden calf. And he's like, okay. And then God comes down and he's like, what the fuck is this golden calf thing about? No more golden calves. Um, interesting side note. God has really particular tastes when it comes to statues. Statues that he hates, golden calf. Statues that he loves, depictions of his son being executed. Um, what? <laughs> Some people just reel into the crucifixion. That's fine. So if we do believe that Deutero Paul exists, um, what do we know about him based on what he wrote? Well, a lot, actually. Uh, here's one quote from a Deutero Pauline letter. One of Crete's own prophets has said it. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This saying is true. So we know he was a racist. Um, we also uh, know that he said, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands. Uh, so we know that he hates crime. Uh, we also know that he says, teach slaves to be subject to their masters and everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted. Deutero in favor of slavery, so not really on board with human rights. So in that sense, Deutero Paul is sort of like an ancient Theresa May. <laughs> um, uh, we, but we know more about him. We know that he said, pay no attention to Jewish myths, so he's an anti-Semite. Uh, we know he said, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat, so he's totally cool with punishing the unemployed. Um, he also said, for there are many rebellious people, full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. So Deutero Paul loves intact penises. So in this sense, he's sort of like an ancient Theresa May. <laughs> um, oh, what's this? People, immigrants who don't make more than 35,000 pounds have to leave the country? What? I just that. Well, that's crazy. Oh, wait. Yeah. It costs 328 pounds just to apply for a visa to come in? How did this stuff get in there? That's weird. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the, the, there is this question, right? Why did Deutero Paul do it and how did he get away with it? There's a couple reasons. One is that it was actually quite common in the ancient world to claim to be writing in the name of someone who wasn't you, but someone who was more uh, authoritative than you. Um, and Paul likely had lots of followers who did this. So back in the, in the olden times, there wasn't really a developed sense of plagiarism, maybe because people couldn't read. Um, and so today, like, sort of the equivalent would be like me writing an English exam and starting off like, Jeffrey Chaucer here. Um, just wanted to weigh in on the concepts of femininity in Jane Eyre. <laughs> but at the time, this was sort of a cool thing to do. Um, another reason is that Paul was writing in a certain period in time, um, and things changed over time. So I'm not going to read this whole quote to you, but suffice it to say that Paul thought Jesus was coming back, like, real soon. Paul was like that guy who's been, like, stood up for a date at a restaurant, and the waiter keeps coming over, he's like, is she going to show me? He's like, oh yeah, definitely, <laughs> she's on her way, and it just goes on longer and longer, it just gets more embarrassing. Um, and obviously over time, like, I don't know if you guys have seen, uh, it became more and more clear that um, Jesus might not be coming back like right away. I don't know if, you, if you've seen like Passion of the Christ, but as yet there's not a sequel. 
Um, so, so the followers of Paul had to write about things that were like, okay, if Jesus is coming back right away, how do we like live in, in a community with each other? Um, so, I mean, what does this all mean? I, I don't know, maybe it means that the Bible is more fallible than we thought, or maybe it means that God works in ways that we don't expect. Um, I think it's all very confusing. And when, when things are confusing, I always turn to the words of someone more intelligent than me, someone with great insight and wisdom. And here's what he says. <laughs> My mom was always really healthy and cautious about her diet, so I'm not a big sugar guy. And uh, I think that's a lesson that we can all take from it. So I, I think Deuteron Paul deserves to be remembered, if nothing else, for pretending to be a person and convincing billions of devout people that he was that person. Thank you very much. Thanks very much to Adam Mastriani. I will link to him in the show notes if you want to find out more about him. If you want to listen to the British Museum member cast, um, you can hear me walking around the Living with Gods exhibition whilst the curator does a lovely lecture on that. Seti Sopo, where me and Simon discuss the opposite of things that don't have a natural opposite, is also out. Do listen to Making History on Radio 4. You can catch up with the series on the BBC iPlayer at the moment. And what else is there to say? Yeah, if you are in London and are interested in going to um, see a Zedless Deadless live, we'll be at the British Museum on March 22nd. I'm still not sure when they're going to actually start selling the tickets for that, but presumably they will tell me. If you are a British Museum member, please do come along. It's going to be a lot of fun and uh, I'm very excited. Um, other than that, I'm doing lots of little promos with other um, podcasts. So here is one that I think you guys will really like. Do you like your history haunted? Then you'll love Macabre London, a podcast hosted by me, Mickey Drews. Every fortnight we uncover one of the forgotten stories of London's bloody past and get to the bottom of some more well-known gruesome tales. So if you're interested in learning the gory, spooky and eerie history of the UK's capital city, then check out the show. You can find us on the Apple Podcasts app, Acast and all other podcast providers by searching for Macabre London. That's M-A-C-A-B-R-E London. I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys. You can email deadlist at hotmail.co.uk and yeah, please do leave reviews on iTunes. I know some people are having problems with PayPal. It appears to be the monthly subscriber thing. I'm looking into Patreon. If anybody has any um, good advice on how you might want to support the show, please do email me. You can go to izzy.com, that is I-S-Z-I.com, and um, get in touch with me through there. That'd be brilliant. Also, have a look out for my Guardian article, which is out. Anyway, guys, I hope you have a fantastic few weeks, and I will see you towards the end of the month with a new episode. Bye!